Can you guys hear me? Okay. Actually, so I actually had some thoughts about proof of personhood like three years ago, and like nobody kind of believed me, and so I was like, let's do an empirical study. And I found Miguel, who's a founder of IDENA, and was so generous and honest to actually lift up the hood and look under his protocol and validate the theses that we had uh, set out. So, okay, what is the context for proof of personhood? Why does it even matter? Well, we're in the age of generative AI, and of course, this raises a number of questions. Will it replace our jobs? Can we trust what's real? How do we govern it? And ultimately, these are questions about influence, about democratic governance, about economic distribution. I should probably put some tokens here instead of dollars. Um, and also about the authenticity of information, which is essential both to well-functioning markets and also well-functioning politics, like democracies. And so this has spurred the rise of proof of person and protocols, which aim to verify unique hum humans, paving the way for you know, domestic and global democratic processes, UBI, and even AI governance. And the ambition of these protocols is simple, to represent each unique human with a corresponding unique digital identity one-to-one. -one. It seems like a very simple, uh, elegant, and ambitious goal. And today we want to offer a critique based off of IDENA's experience in a paper we released at this point two months ago, I think, uh, called Compressed to Zero, The Silent Strings of Personhood, Silent Strings of Proof of Personhood. And now I will turn the mic over to Misha, who can explain why IDENA. It's the next slide. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, first of all, uh, Adina was the first proof of person blockchain with uh, uh, John Jones uh, network of validators with one person, one vote consensus algorithm. And uh, Adina uh, successfully solved the problem of filtering bots and validating humans, like stopping uh, the problem of account trading with a uh, novel so called identity staking, where participants could not be, you know, uh, uh, credibly sell their accounts on the black market, which is the problem of other proof of person protocols like uh, WorldCoin today. And the, first of all, I would like to um, uh, tell a bit about uh, the IDNAS ambition. And uh, I, I would like to stress that it was not a proof of person protocol or identity protocol. So first of all, it was a blockchain based on uh, identity. Uh, so we, uh, at the beginning, try to find some uh, solutions for identity to Im Im implement integrate that as a consensus layer for the blockchain. Um, so our motivation was uh, to, pr to provide like alternative to proof of stake system and address the challenges of centralization, um, which is kind of, these are the, the problems inherent in capital, which is uh, always heavy tail Pareto distributed. And now we can see that uh, in proof of stake networks, uh, large staking pools um, had like an inevitable economy of scale. And as a result, solo miners a vanishing, uh, giving way to oligopoly. So that was uh, uh, the idea of uh, Adina. So in contrast, Adina aimed to build a um, decentralized network of nodes uh, operated by individuals. Uh, so the goal was to, to build like uh, an excessive a network with an excess, excessive number of no, um, validators and nodes, and simply to solve technical problem, which is kind of blockchain scalability problem. And in such sharded network, uh, uh, every node was intended to run by uh, unique operator with, with unique uh, verified account. So what happened? Various uh, proof of person protocols establish uniqueness in a different ways. And unlike of WorldCoin that uh, offer, they, they employ biometric data, uh, IDENA relies on uh, so-called validation ceremonies. It's kind of uh, simultaneous uh, cognitive tests, which happen every few weeks for all participants synchronously. And the uniqueness is based on the idea that you cannot be in multiple places at the same time. And uh, by solving this kind of flip tests, uh, you've, you've proved that you are not bot. Uh, and uh, the flip test is a test which is based on the user-generated story that makes sense in one configuration, but meaningless in another one. So for example, you can see um, on the left side, the sequence of images tells a coherent story about a beasting, whereas uh, causality on the right side makes no sense. So what happened? Um, I didn't launch in uh, 2019, and accounts steadily increased. But as the network grew, the on-chain data become, began to show some kind of suspicion patterns of transactions, sending rewards from multiple accounts to the same addresses at the same time. 
So this kind of coordinated one-way transfers to the same time to the same wallet uh, implied some sort of automation, which uh, would require third-party access to participants' private keys, right? So either these participants uh, had unwittingly ceded uh, their private keys to third party, or they just never had them. By December 2020, one of the uh, IDENA users uh, contacted us and admitted uh, to running a human farm or a pool of humans. So that means that it's a kind of a high information operator that pays to low information participants, like puppets, to periodically perform validation ceremonies and verify their uh, unique accounts um, in exchange for controlling their accounts and their private keys. So puppets were either unaware about their private keys or they knew their private keys, but they were unaware about the significance within the protocol. So the puppeteering was not a traditional uh, civil attack where malicious actors you know, uh, can fake multiple uh, accounts, typically using some algorithmic bots. But it was, um, but instead, as, as the protocol had filtered bots and successfully authenticated, like uh, flesh and blood humans, the provision was de facto a civil attack of humans acting like programmable bots. So at best, puppeteers uh, like extracted some amount of delta between the uh, UBI paid by the protocol and the worker wages, or at worst, they just could take all the rewards. But was the picture so black and white? Um, actually, pool operators also claimed that some awakened puppets were coming back. Uh, so where they were just offering uh, some, con some service to consensual uh, participants and being remunerated for that. Uh, and it's because of this like earning rewards on IDENA protocol presented by a number of hustles, like you need to run your own node, you need to like sell the coins on the, mm, to convert it into local currency, and the pool operators could uh, handle this operational hustles better than participants on their own. And in short, they were just cooperating and simply provided some services for uh, some like participants. So the reality that there is a spectrum, like two, two extreme possibilities and spectrum in between, and the same transaction pattern on chain could actually uh, indicate both puppeteering or voluntary cooperation. And like both extremes, different not in not how they look like on chain, but um, how the information and control is distributed off chain. So in puppeteering, operators have more control and more in, and, and more information. So they, they know how the protocol works and they control the private keys, and so they capitalize uh, the symmetry of information and control uh, to to get the uh, control over accounts in exchange for minimum wages and like. Ma maximally extracting on their own advantage. In contrast, cooperation has greater symmetry in information and control, so participants may know how the protocol works and they, they control their private keys, but nonetheless, they can find it mutually beneficial to kind of uh, pull the resources and uh, delegate control, including their private keys, to an operator for greater rewards and uh, with economy of scale, right? And holding operators accountable off-chain. So despite of aiming uh, to establish a transparent network of individuals with unique accounts, uh, protocol collapsed into hidden groups and sub-networks. So these groups, whether autocratic or democratic, were competing for the same economic pie. In March uh, 2021, uh, IDENA community, instead of just deciding to slash out this, uh, uh, these accounts, they, they agreed to fork, to make a hard fork, and bring these pools out of un unquantified shadows. Um, and we use so-called delegation. So on-chain delegation gave pools uh, economic incentives, so now pools could uh, earn mining rewards uh, using only one node instead of running multiple nodes for every uh, their account. Uh, but what's more important with delegation, uh, now pools could um, operate, like, uh, handle operational hustles even without needing to know the private keys of their uh, pooled accounts. So the pr providing uh, these economic incentives, uh, and the delegation succeeded in making pools transparent. So you can see the green um, area shows the network pre-delegation. And after, uh, when, when the accounts could not be differentiated, even if they were on, like, controlled by the same pool operator. Um, but after delegation, the protocol could measure the size of the pools. So after delegation, um, as the network grew, uh, the growth was notably among large pools, which are red and pink. Uh, while solar accounts, which are blue, aligned, 
constituting like a smaller and smaller proportion of the network up until the peak of the puppeteering crisis in May 2022. So the percentage of cell accounts in blue shrunk from 62% to 27% of the network and large pools had a uh, reverse trend, uh, ballooning from 22% to 61% of the network accounts. And the same happens with the rewards. So large pools also captured larger share of rewards from the fixed economic pie, um, selling the coins and dumping a dinner price, squeezing rewards from solo accounts. So as the number of uh, single node pools increased, the nodes as a percentage of the network also like in turn significantly dropped, leading to loss of throughput and security. So the, third, uh, the, 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 the purpose of delegation was uh, to make coordinated pools visible, but also to, make, um, to enable pool operators to uh, handle operational hassles without uh, needing to know the private keys of the, their accounts. But oddly, uh, large pools continued to show the signs of third-party key access uh, with automated simultaneous or synchronous like, or uh, sequential transactions. And based on these uh, criteria, we actually analyzed uh, top 31 pools uh, that had ever been larger than 100 accounts in the IDENA protocol history. And all these 31 pools showed the signs of third-party key access, even regardless of delegation. And moreover, um, some pools had financial ties, so if we treat them as the same entity or subnetwork, then um, these 31 top pools were in fact 23 entities. So the puppeteering crisis reached its peak in May 2022. There were only 23 entities uh, representing less than 1% of the distinct entities in the network, controlling at least 40% of the accounts and almost half of the rewards. This prompted us uh, to change the model from proof of personhood to so-called uh, sublinear identity staking, which is a kind of combination of proof of stake and proof of personhood. And this will be the topic of our next uh, paper titled between, uh, like between Zero and One. Thank you. So, uh, you can hold, hold your applause. <laughs> so presentation's not over yet. So OK. Um, so this damning statistic that Misha gave about third-party key access, to a lot of you in this room, this is just prima facie evidence of puppeteering, and the common phrase is not your keys, not your coins. Uh, but to others, right, third-party key access could actually be this voluntary custody as a service choice by a high information participant, presuming they could hold their operators accountable off-chain. And so we wanted to address this argument, and to this higher standard, we argue that there was an improbable lack of marketing and disputes that would otherwise accompany off-chain accountable custody relationships. And this silence, and hence the title of our paper, this silence, this absence of advertising or legal disputes or even just customer complaints was more indicative of puppeteering than an accountable principal agent relationship. And then there are other damning factors. The known jurisdictions of the three largest pools, which Misha showed in the previous slide, you know, they were in very weak rule of law jurisdictions like Russia, Egypt, and Indonesia. The solo accounts and family pools with the strong social ties um, you know, shrunk while large pools with greater than 100 accounts with weak social ties were just ballooning. Um, and as Misha showed, conversations with the co top human pool operators themselves controlling 14% of the accounts, confirmed that they were actually indeed paying participants to perform all the validation ceremonies and do all the things to prove uniqueness. Um, and of course, the top three networks controlled almost a third of the network accounts, and they had meteoric rises and falls consistent with puppeteering and, and uh, pumping and dumping. So based on the totality of these facts, we concluded that this intended model of one person, one vote, run reward, this very egalitarian model had actually collapsed into puppeteered subnetworks. And yet, this analysis was still very cursory. It excluded 84 pools between uh, 15 and 100 counts and 411 family pools, less than 15 accounts. So it excluded actually 95% of all pools. So the statistics could only get worse, not better. So I want to talk quickly about the takeaways here. The first one is by giving humans economic incentives to periodically differentiate themselves from bots, even as low as $2 to $14 every few weeks, which is a lot lower than protocols, other protocols do today, um, IDENA gave more informed, resourceful humans financial incentives to control and puppeteer less informed humans as if they were bots. 
takeaway two, and when participants traded their time, not even their account, just their time, for a paycheck from these more resourceful humans, they transformed a system that was intended to be one person, one vote, into one token, one vote, where plutocrats and puppeteers gained outsized influence. And takeaway three, these economies of scale for the more resourceful to exploit is common to actually all global protocols. Other protocols that validate humans in different ways, for example, through biometric scans or whatever, but just because participants don't have to run a node or do periodic cognitive tests doesn't mean that they don't have hassles. They just actually have a different set of hassles, which intermediaries and operators will be happily to perform with a financial incentive. In this case, again, it was just 2 to $14 every few weeks. Which takes us to takeaway number four. These exploits might not always manifest as puppeteering, uh, but they can, always, they can also surface as account trading. Now, what's interesting about IDENA and why I wanted to study and take a lot of time off to work with Misha to study it is they actually did stymie account trading. They solved that problem through novel mechanisms like identity staking, which is very similar to Macy, if you're familiar with that. Um, but other protocols, notably WorldCoin, um, just a year ago actually had documented cases of account trading. I'm not sure how that was resolved. Um, and so account trading in these protocols should not be treated as evidence of like advanced mechanisms or protections. To the contrary, they might actually just single a lack of them and be a precursor to puppeteering. Which takes me to takeaway number five. The challenge of filtering humans from bots controlling accounts can't actually be separated from the informational challenge. So proof of personhood seeks to differentiate humans from bots but not their biases. And as Idina demonstrated, when given incentives to differentiate themselves from bots, humans also have incentives to align, control, and puppeteer the information of other humans like bots to amplify their own biases. And it's biases, really, or the problem of faction, if you're familiar with, with James Madison and the Federalist Papers, it's this problem of faction that we really care about when we're building systems of democratic governance. So, this information challenge, in my opinion, will actually become more acute as humans integrate biologically with neural interfaces and BCIs. And this distinction between filtering humans from bots and humans acting like programmable bots will actually blur more, if not collapse, revealing this much more foundational challenge than establishing biological uniqueness, which is establishing the informational uniqueness of participants or the extent to which they cluster with the same interests and biases. And again, this is an informational problem, not a technical problem, and in fact, a social one. So we introduce this term called de facto sibyls, um, which are puppets or humans acting like bots. And these de facto sibyls are natural objects of colluders or puppeteers. And by extension, this problem of de facto sibyl resistance is actually a mutually implicated and mirror challenge or mirror articulation to the challenge of collusion resistance. And neither can be solved independently, but both, both must be tackled simultaneously. Finally, the last takeaway, um, and this is to the more sort of uh, technically minded, um, the last takeaway is actually that thwarting on-chain vote buying, for example, with receipt freemans or advancements like proofs of complete knowledge, these advancements don't actually solve for off-chain vote buying into meat space, and it, in fact, may encourage it as a low-cost alternative. So IDENA, again, undermined account trading with identity staking, and the next best and cheapest alternative actually was to go into meat space, and vote buying became off-chain puppeteering or buying participants' time. Similarly, um, when on-chain vote buying and, and tease or trusted execution environments becomes costly, we can expect the resourceful to simply move off-chain into meat space. So I think the final takeaway is the IDENA experiment underscores the importance of thinking in terms of incentives, systems, and most importantly, acknowledging the ties and the social ties that arise from talking and trading and, and information asymmetries. In our future work, as Idina mentioned, we will, uh, as Misha mentioned, we will examine the relationship between incenting unique accounts and stake in a paper about sublinear identity staking called Between Zero and One. And then following that, I'll expand more on what I think is a more promising solution beyond Zero One about social identity. Thank you. We can take some questions. <laughs> Mr. Khan? Mr. Uh, 
Yeah, I have a question. Uh, what was it, Misha? Yes. Oh. Yeah, I I'm wondering how closely are you following uh, AI developments? Because I'm wondering how close AI is getting to actually solving these flip problems. Yeah, it's a good question. Actually, we uh, we all rely on the uh, you know key one factor that humans actually are creating these flip tests, but we also have kind of friendly AI that helps uh, participants to create AI resistance flip tests, and we constantly like you know uh, improve that AI that kind of probably like not that sophisticated as ChatGPT or other AIs, but they can kind of, you know, uh, have like unbiased set of uh, flip tests that allowed for validations. But most, what's most important, I think that um, in terms of the costs, it's much more, you know, efficient just to hire like people to, to, to validate their accounts instead of just employing the, uh, you know, AI or like other algorithmic bots. Hi. Uh, what is your take on 1P, 1V in major DAOs today? Do you think it's undesirable for token holders, or are you seeing any? One person, one vote? Yeah. I think, so, you know, it depends what your purpose is. So a lot of people say, okay, we want democratic decision making, we're gonna do one person, one vote, okay? But that was like, you know, we stopped that experiment when Socrates died by a hemlock milkshake, right? It's like tyrannical majorities. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a mechanism that is nested within other mechanisms. And so, you know, in like, you know, modern analog democratic nation states, it's complemented by, for example, separation of powers, federalism, bicameralism, presentment, checks and balances, and so on. And it's just a, a signal. But if you rely on it exclusively, then of course it gets captured. And as Idina showed, there's actually an incentive to just buy accounts, right? Um, and so I think, you know, there's much more sophisticated mechanisms. Um, I think quadratic voting obviously is uh, more advanced, but of, of course, if you're doing it in a distributed system like a DAO, um, that sublinear discrimination is actually a financial incentive to buy accounts. And so the challenge is how do you actually achieve the kind of welfare enhancing uh, properties of quadratic voting without this um, you know, incentive to buy accounts. And that's where this, you know, all the stuff about collusion resistance and social identity and re finding other ways to represent human beings and, um, and right, discount against like biases comes in and you get a much richer version of even quadratic voting, which is called plural voting, which acknowledges these weaknesses. Um, yet I, I, I still think is more advanced. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I have a question. Um, I actually visited this this week the WorldCoin store. They have a storefront here in Mita. Uh, everyone can go and pretend they don't know anything about crypto and they will explain it to you in a really compelling way. Um, so they basically tell you, of course, they're giving you free money. Uh, but the main argument that they're telling you is that it's done by the same company that's uh, building ChatGPT and therefore um, AGI so that the proof of personhood is very important um, to prove yourself ahead of time before AGI ca comes. To me, um, I, I can see your face, Pooja. <laughs> to me, that was the most compelling argument, I've, selling argument I've ever heard. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't believe it was real, but it was very real. Um, and I'm wondering here because I, I'm a fan of your research, of course, um, and we have a room full of builders. Um, how do, and knowing these are these are the selling points of the people um, selling this technology and having people scan their faces. Um, how do we move forward with, ID, with applications, ideas, or you know? evangelizing about the things that you guys are saying, uh, because I feel it's very siloed right now. So, so there's a couple of things. So <clears throat> there's different marketing to different people. And so the point of this study was to show, look, this marketing around this is going to enable democratic rails and a UBI, that just doesn't work. It ends up in oligopoly. So then the next thing is, OK, well, what about information provenance, right? And it, yeah, that's like a, it's a, cheap and quick and dirty way. The problem is, of course, there are network effects to this and complementarities, and then other things get wrapped into it. And when you're part of this network, 
and you just sort of hit a certain, you know, specific like threshold, and like if you don't participate it, then you're like excluded, right, from um, certain aspects of like the economy or social life. And so that that's like the problem and the, the sort of scary thing about proof of personhood is that it, like it could actually work. Now, what do you actually do to uh, on the information provenance point, not the democratic governance, not the UBI point, but how do you actually build um, systems that check this power and rank it more accountable so it doesn't bleed into like democratic governance that ends up being actually oligopolistic governance? I think it, you have to kind of take a step back and look at, well, what actually is human identity? Like, who is Pooja? Is Pooja like me, this flesh and blood person? Well, like, actually, no. Like, you can think about me as the sum of all my affiliations and conversations with different groups and solidarities and my opinions and beliefs. And that's actually a function and an output of a social process that is like networked and, and rich and complex. And so like, just as you can represent you know, groups as composed of individuals, you can represent individuals as composed of groups. And a lot of people in crypto are super into like the sovereign individual narrative. Well, guess what? The sovereign individual doesn't decentralize power. The sovereign individual always loses against the nation state. It always loses banks against big tech. The way to actually decentralize power is you form coalitions and you form groups. So if you want to actually express identity and push power down at the same time, we need to find richer ways to express real groups that actually are solving problems. And groups like as, you know, from families to communities and at any social scale and enable them to coordinate. And that's actually how you make these larger systems more accountable, um, even if they might be solving this information providence problem. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> <It's on the laughs>